Oh my God, today is so exciting because we're going to embark on learning 3JS. This right here is going to be our very first little project. Look at that. What is up everybody, Gary Simon here. Today, like I mentioned, we're going to really start taking a deep dive into 3JS and that's starting today. Now, not every single video going forward will be about 3JS, but a lot of them will be. And it's always something I really wanted to learn. And so just recently, I started to learning 3JS uh, primarily through a new course. And I told Bruno, who is the course creator, that I would give him a plug here. Um, and this is his site for the course. I definitely recommend taking it. I believe it's like, it's something like 30 hours or something like that. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but it is quite lengthy and extremely in depth. So definitely check out uh, this if you're really interested in you know learning every single detail essentially about 3JS. Um, I'm also going to, okay, so you might be wondering, what is 3JS? Well, 3JS.org is the main site. And there are a lot of examples here. Um, if you've ever heard of awards, awwwards.com, many of the, the sites that win awards are using 3JS, not all of them, but, but many of them, along with GSAP, and, which is the Greensock Animation Platform. And just to show you, I mean, this is amazing. This is a site that's been it's made with 3JS. I mean, just, take a look at this. Now this is a user interface that people can use and this is all made possible with 3JS. Here's another one, Medal of Honor. I mean, this one is pretty nuts as well. Now, sometimes they have loading uh, icons if there's really asset, you know, there's tons of assets for it to download, but it can also be very quick depending on, you know, what it is that you need to do. Um, a lot of particle effects that you can that you can integrate, and really, my goal uh, with 3JS in this channel is to teach people how to use 3JS primarily for like landing pages and web design, and not not like games because you can create actual games with this. Um, so definitely check out his site, and definitely look forward. I'm going to be creating a 3JS playlist. And we're going to be creating some really cool stuff starting with this relatively simple example today. So let's get started. Now, wait one second. You're about to watch me tackle some advanced front-end development stuff. But if you're not very great with front-end development, then you should definitely check out the front-end developer career path at scrimba.com. They recently launched their front-end development career path, which is a collection of courses that cover HTML, CSS, JavaScript, React, and much, much more, as you see. It's over 75 hours of awesome content, there are hundreds of interactive coding challenges, and it's all geared towards helping you go from beginner to someone that's hireable as a front-end developer. So check out the first link in the description below to get 50% off. Alrighty, let's get started. Oh, I forgot by the way. Let me turn off that, or get rid of that taskbar. All right, um, so right here we're at GitHub. Um, literally six minutes ago, I created this public repository where you can get started with just a um, a quick setup, really. And this setup is uh, basically, I stole it from uh, Bruno Simon. Actually, I asked for permission first <laughs> on Discord. Um, and it's just gonna help you get up and running with a WebKit uh, and 3JS and just a, a quick boilerplate code because a lot of it is very boilerly, boilerly boilerplate-ish, if that's, a, it's, it's, that's definitely not a word. Um, and so I'm gonna show you how to, to use this real quick if you've never cloned a repo. Um, you just wanna come here, this is in the YouTube description, and we're going to come over here and code. HTTPS, take that version, copy this right here real quick. I'm using Visual Studio Code, and we're gonna go to, real quickly, view the terminal. All right, I'm gonna go to CD code to get in my uh, code folder, that's where I store, store all of my projects. And we're just gonna type git clone, we're gonna right click here, it's gonna copy that URL, or paste it rather, and we're gonna give a, a custom name um, for this. So I'm just gonna call this 3JS DC hyphen one, or 3JS hyphen DC hyphen one, as in like, you know, 3JS 
design course like the first 3GS video. So hit enter and it's very quick as you can see. So we're gonna uh, CD into that folder, 3JS DC one. And then we run NPM I for install. Of course, you're gonna have to have the Node.js installed along with the Node Package Manager. Um, you can Google it if you don't know what that is because then you'll be able to run these commands. Then finally, when you wanna start it up, npm run dev. When we do this, it's gonna start a server right here. It's gonna load this up and there we go. <laughs> we have a torus, a ring that's floating and stuff. Now the cool thing about this starter is that it gets a lot of the code, like I said, it's very boiler boilerplate-ish code uh, out of the way. Um, to make it responsive like this, you know, you have to, to write, you know, a decent amount of JavaScript to get it working. So a lot of this stuff is set it and forget it, but we will quickly uh, look at uh, some of the code um, real quick. So let's go ahead and we're going to open up a folder, the one that we just created. And here it is, select folder. All right, so we have four different folders here. The node modules, of course, you don't ever wanna mess with that. Don't worry about it. We have the source right here and we have static right here as well. Now the source is where we're going to be working in. Um, let's take a look at the index.html, as you can see, it's very simple. Um, all we have is just a canvas of class WebGL. So there's two different ways to get the canvas on there with 3JS. You can actually get the canvas element and add it through JavaScript, um, or you can have it right here as well in HTML. We're gonna use this way because it gives us more control and flexibility for when and if we wanna add more HTML um, in here. So let's take a look at the style.css. Right here, not much happening. So we're getting rid of the margin and padding. Um, font family Poffins. I didn't even import the font. I should not have included that in the starter pack. That was an accident. And then WebGL, we have it by default fixed here. We're gonna be changing that later. Um, this is the canvas element. And so that's all that is. And then here is the bread and butter. All right, so first we're importing the CSS up here through JavaScript. Um, we're importing three right there. So we're gonna access it through Caps Lock 3. Um, importing orbit controls, as you can see, it's dimmed out because we're not using it just yet. I'm gonna show you, um, it's pretty cool though. Um, and then this right here, this is a debug, dat, dat.gui. That's actually right up here where it says close controls and open controls. It's real tiny, you might not be able to see it, but you're, we're gonna be using that, uh, which is gonna make our life a lot easier. Um, so coming on down here, of course, we're, we're instantiating with uh, the constant GUI or GUI to um, give us ourselves, you know, the ability to create these, this uh, debug panel. We're not using it yet, as you can see, it's dimmed out. We have the canvas element, so we just use vanilla JavaScript to get this uh, canvas element right here, canvas.webgl is the class, as we can see in the index.html. So that gives us access to that. And then our, let's move these things around a little bit. And then we have our scene, all right? So you always, when it comes to 3JS and Absolute Basics, you have to have several different things. You have to have your scene, all right? So we've created a scene here. This is one of those things, kind of like set it and forget it for the most part, especially if you're a beginner. We have objects, all right? We have materials, we have meshes. Now the way these three things work together, Objects are basically your geometry, the physical you know, shape of something. Uh, your materials right here are the, the clothing, if you will. So if you wanna if I give an analogy, an object is your body, the materials are like your skin, so to speak, um, and then your mesh, this brings, that ties both of them together. So when we create a new mesh, we use new three dot mesh, we first pass in, in the first parameter, the geometry, and then the second pr parameter, the material that will go on to that geometry. And then we finally add that to the scene. So you can think of it as a four-step process in order to actually get something onto your canvas. First, you create the geometry, that's your object. You create the skin for it, your material, and then you combine them together as a mesh, and then you add it to the scene. That's all it is, all right? Next up, we have lighting. 
Um, so there's a lot of different, oh, by the way, I should mention this. When it comes to objects and geometry, there's a lot of different types of built-in geometry that you can choose from. When it comes to 3JS, you can create cubes, rectangles, spheres. Uh, there's a lot of them and they're all available in the really well set up documentation for 3JS. Um, there's a lot of different types of materials as well. Um, same thing with lights. This is a point light, but you have access to many other types of uh, lights as well. Um, coming down here, a lot of this is the boilerplate stuff. So the sizes uh, object right here, we're storing the width of the window inner width and height of the window inner height. Um, when the browser is resized, we have to notify that to 3JS so that it knows how you know wide the uh, the canvas element should be. So that's basically what's happening here. You really don't have to, to, to worry about this part at all. This is the boilerplate stuff, set it and forget it. Um, we also need a camera and a renderer. So when I was going back to uh, all the things that you need, like I said, you have to have the scene set up, you have to have your objects, um, you have to have your camera. And of course, as with lighting, uh, materials and, and objects, you have a lot of different, not a lot, but you have several different cameras that you can choose from. This is the perspective camera that gives you kind of like a real world perspective of what things look like. Um, but then you also have uh, another type of or orthographic camera, which kind of gives you the isometric perspective in your scene. We're gonna be doing that in the future. Um, and then, uh, of course, these all have different parameters in which you can experiment with. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go too much into detail about the absolute basics here. Um, we could set the camera position as you can see in the X, Y, Z. Um, see and add your camera. Then you also have a, have a renderer. And again, this is one of those things that's kind of set it and forget it. So the renderer takes in um, the canvas at, at right here. And then at the bottom, we have uh, the animation portion. So right here is basically what it, when it concerns to be able to animate and uh, request animation frame. This is has nothing to do with uh, 3JS, but this is just vanilla JavaScript. And basically, depending on your frame rate, it's basically running this tick function over and over extremely fast. So as you can see, we have this sphere. I don't know why I call it a sphere. It's not a sphere anymore. But it, 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 we're setting the rotation on the Y axis uh, to half of the elapsed time. And thus, we get in animating like this on the Y axis. So enough talking, uh, we're gonna get rid of this and we're gonna kinda just start from scratch, uh, at least in respect to, to adding um, an object here. So let's go ahead up here and we're gonna go to our uh, objects. We're gonna go ahead and just get rid of this. And of course, when we do that, it is going to break, definitely. So if we get Control Shift I, and we refresh this. Wait, what's happening here? Oh, did I run my correct, uh, let's see here. Terminal, view, terminal. Yeah, I'm not even running. M NPM, wait, what is happening here? NPM run dev. There must have been an issue or something because I thought I was running that. But it's not gonna load because now with geometry is not defined. All right. So we want, we're, let's just work with a sphere here. And the sphere uh, is baked in, is one of the, the, the um, primitives that you can use that uh, 3JS will provide you with. So under objects, we're just going to put a const of sphere geometry. You can name this whatever you want. And we're going to say new three sphere ge or buffer geometry, all right? And it takes in a few different properties and this would be a good a good point here to get into the habit of looking at the three uh, js documentation so if there's a sphere buffer geometry and you have no clue what it is type it in google you'll find it quickly and it's going to give you all the information that you're going to need to know so for the, under the constructor we have the radius we have the width segments the height segments so that's what we're specifying first all right, so um, this is gonna control the size and the number of segments. 
is basically you see how some of these have like these these points and these different faces the more you increase those right here the more like an actual circle it's going to look like now of course the more that you have the slower it will end up being for performance but because we're only going to be dealing with this project with just one sphere it doesn't really matter all that much all right, and of course you could play with these. And by the way, this is that DAT GUI debug panel. We're gonna be able to create some of our own and control exactly as I as we want. All right, so we're gonna put 0.5 and then also 64 by 64 for the different segments. Now, I called this sphere geometry. Really, we can just call it geometry because we already have it set up down here. And when we save, we'll see that if I come back over here rather, we have to refresh it whenever there's error. Now we have our sphere here sitting in the middle. All right, so now uh, let's go ahead and focus on the actual material. So there are a lot of different type of materials. Like this is a, a mesh basic material. We can set the color as you can see by material.color. Like uh, this is red, um, we can go, 00 ff 0, 0 here make it green not that exciting um, we're going to use what's called the mesh standard material and this is a really powerful type of material um, that really allows you to convey uh, the real world as much as possible if that makes sense it has a lot of options that we can use so when we use this, I, in fact, this would be a great time once again to get in the habit of looking at the documentation. All right, so PBR, physically based rendering, and this is what the mesh standard material gives us. Look at all these different properties that it has. Quite a bit. And one of the great ways to be able to experiment with what these properties do is by using the dat.gui little debug control panel. And this will give you a lot of options and you'll kind of be able to see exactly what all these things do. So if I increase this roughness, what does that do? All right, so it will change it, uh, a, a very low roughness will make it really glossy uh, in a sense. And right here, you don't see any of those shines, so it's it's the opposite, it's like matte black, M-A-T-T-E. Metalness, what does that do? All right, so the further you increase this, it just makes it look like it could be more like metal or darker. And these can really play together to give you some interesting looks, so to speak. Here's flat shading wireframe look how cool that is very awesome so there's so much more that you can play with so for us let's take this mesh standard material and by the way these properties can be defined right here or we can go ahead and define them outside of it by referencing the constant so material dot metalness equals we're going to put 0.7 Shift Alt down to replicate that and roughness we'll put at 0.2 or so. All right, so the color, we can of course give this uh, a color. I'm gonna choose uh, something that's darker right here. That's 292929. And now we can't even see it. We can only see like this little um, light that's bouncing off the light that we created, the point light. So at this point, we're gonna kind of change focus real quick because one of the cool things that we can do if we wanna see this, we wanna change the background color. The way I'm gonna choose to do it, and there's, there's obviously we can do it within 3JS, but I, I kinda just wanted to do it within the browser is we can make the background of 3JS transparent and then we can see whatever we want based on the website background. All right, so what we can do is and where we do that is in the renderer. So where is the renderer? Right here. We put it in the options. We put alpha, true. We save, and now 
we can see our black ball. <laughs> All right, so let's change the background too. So we'll do that, of course, in the CSS. So anything that we do here is gonna show up uh, on the, in the background behind the canvas element. All right, so let's just do a background. And what color, I didn't use a color, I used uh, a gray. So it's an RGB value of 24, 24, 24. And it's just slightly lighter than this. Um, I kind of like the look of that. All right, so now that we have that, let's go back to our script here. And the next thing that we'll worry about is we want to give this, If we want, you, there's a lot of different ways that you can shape a your 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 geometry your object um, and without actually having to do it by hand through actual by creating actual vertices like in a 3D program um, and that's through that's done through the material so the material um, especially with mesh standard material it has what's called normal maps all right so let's go to Google real quick and I can show you what a normal map is or what it looks like. So a normal map looks like this, all right? It's just kind of this weird purplish blue pinkish. And it basically, it's, it's an, you may have heard of a bump map. Um, and bump maps are grayscale, but it's the same thing, except normal maps provide you with more detail, not you, it provides, you know, whatever. It, and by the way, normal maps aren't just specific to 3JS, this is a 3D terminology and concept. But what it means is basically, if we apply this, it's just like a picture, like a PNG file. If we apply this on to, and, and specify as a normal map onto our object, and our object is just a sphere, a, you know, completely flat surface, depending on how it's structured, it will make it look 3D or make those areas adjust uh, in such a way that it makes it look no longer just a circle. It could look like brick. It could look like this, uh, what do you call that? Why am I coming up with a blank? Uh, it just makes it look like whatever texture uh, you know, is presented here. Like this looks like stone. So this could be a really great way to create like a planet. Um, and so we're, I found, I found a, uh, a pattern, like a golf ball pattern texture. So we're going to, but it was only grayscale. So we're gonna take that pattern and we're gonna convert it from the grayscale to a normal map that looks like this. All right, so what I've done uh, real quickly, we're going to open, right click here in static and we're going to reveal in File Explorer and we're gonna go in there and we're gonna create a textures folder. And I'm going to paste in a file. Now I'm gonna to try to remember to link this directly in the YouTube description so you can follow along and do the same thing. Um, we're just gonna call this height. And if I double click it, this is what it looks like. All right, it's just a repeated little um, circular gradient balls in the middle. So what we can do, um, we need to convert this to an actual height map. Um, or normal map rather. And so to do that, there's a normal map generator that I found, normal map generator. And we click on this and we can go ahead and choose this and this will allow us real quickly, let me copy and get the right URL. Here we go. I'm gonna go up here. We're gonna choose height, there we go. And so there's a, a number of options here um, that we can use uh, to, to blur it if we want. I'm gonna choose to blur it a little bit. And you can also adjust the strength and all that good stuff. I think right here is gonna be good. And then we can just choose, uh, you can choose the name. By default, it's gonna be normal map. We're gonna choose download. And I'm gonna show it in my folder. All right, and then what we'll do is copy that and then we'll go back here. I'll make sure that it's called normal map. And this is our normal map right here. So what we'll do is uh, coming back to our materials right here, 
we're going to specify that normal map. But first, before we do that, we're going to use what's called a texture loader. All right. So there's a lot of different type of loaders in 3JS and there's a loader for textures and you want to use these texture loaders, especially when you have um, projects that have a lot of different assets. Uh, because then you'll be able to create like a little loading thing and then like a loading graphic like a lot of those 3GS sites and examples have um, and then it'll be able to load properly so what we're going to do up here I'll just call it loading uh, is put in um, and we're creating we're going to instantiate and create a constant for a texture loader so texture loader equals new three texture loader. All right, so now what we can do is reference that file that we've added in our static textures normal map. So we can get rid of this one, by the way. All right, so now what we can do is say const uh, normal texture equals a uh, texture loader dot load and then we put in the path to it. So it's going to be in textures forward slash normal map dot PNG. All right. So now, of course, we have to reference that under our materials. So we're going to say material dot normal map equals normal texture. All right. Let me make sure I have that all well and good. All right. So let's save this and see what ends up happening. All right, interesting. So we have, it, it's kind of hard to see what's happening, right? I mean, we have this white light and there's something cool happening, but we can't really tell what. So at this point, this is gonna be a great um, justification for, for using dat.gui, which is gonna allow us to start playing around with the different properties so we can try to create something that looks cool. If you don't use something like that with those easy to use, you know, graphic user interface controls like the sliders and stuff, try you have to then just rely on typing in values and going back and forth. It's a crap way. So what we want to do is we want to be able to use dat.gui to start positioning things. All right. So before we do that, let's add another light. So we have a point light here, but let's add another one um, that we're gonna give it color, essentially. So for that, let's go ahead and create basically the same thing right here. So we're just gonna copy and paste that, const point light two, and this one's going to be a, a red light, FF000, all right? Uh, four zeros, there we go. And then we're gonna give it uh, an intensity of like two. Um, the position, you can set the position by the way by doing you know position.x.y.z or you can do it all in one. So let's just uh, select all three of those, control forward slash to uncomment, I mean to comment rather. We're gonna do point light two dot position dot set and now we can set all three of them uh, in the parameters. So for the parameters, I'm just going to just leave these by default at zero for now. Um, actually, let's let's put them at actually let's just do um, one, one and one. These are X, Y and Z. And then um, let's also put point light two dot intensity equals. Let's just leave this at one. And then we want to scene add the point light two. All right, let's see what happens here, if anything noticeable. Okay, so now we have something here. Now, if we want to start moving these around, these lights and positioning them, like I said, we can go back and adjust the X, Y, Zs of these, or we can use dat.gui, which makes it a million times better for setting up your scene, not just for light positions, but object positions, rotations, and a lot of other stuff. So let's do that. So we've already created our constant of of GUI or GUI if you want to call it. Um, we're going to just underneath point light to uh, reference our GUI. Now, one thing we want to do first, well, you know, we're not going to do that first. We're going to do this after in a second. I'm thinking ahead. Let's just go ahead and add 
we're going to reference GUI dot add, and we want to reference uh, the 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 prop not the property but um, our point light two because we want to be able to control that red light we just added. So we simply put point light two dot position, and then we put in in string format in the second parameter. Is it going to be position X, Y, or Z? So for now, let's just put Y. All right, so when we do this, at this point, we can see we have Y, and it says 1. Now, if we increase this, like left click and drag this up and down, you can see we're moving it up and down on the Y axis. Very cool. But we have some other uh, abilities here. So for instance, if we want to put a minimum value, like maybe negative three on the, the Y axis is, you know, we don't want to go further than that. We can do that. We have to have a max. So maybe we don't want to go higher than three. Um, and then we also have a step. So we could put 0 0.01. So that means when you increment it, it will only, it, it'll increment it by, you know, 0.1 or, or like 1%. So if we save this now, we're also going to see that it's going to turn into an actual slider. This, it, it was a text field before because we didn't specify a minimum and a maximum. When you specify the min and max, you get the slider option right here. So it's handy. Oops, let's go back there. It's handy because we can see the value right to the right right here. And then once we find a value that we really like, we can put it in uh, and hard code it into right here. So we also, in order to position this, we're only doing it on one axis so far. We want to add the other two. So shift alt down two times to replicate it, put X and Z here. You know what? Let's also do intensity. So we'll replicate that again. So we're just going to put point light right there and then just put intensity right here. All right. So let's put uh, on the X negative six because I found when I was experimenting with that negative six, I, I wanted more uh, for, for the X axis to be able to go that far. Um, maybe we can put six here too. And then uh, for intensity, I believe you don't have a negative intensity, so it starts at zero. And then we'll say all the way up to 10 or so. All right, so now we're gonna hit save and look at all this stuff that we have to work with now. So now um, we can move it over here. We can push it over here. So now we have full control. Awesome, awesome. So there's another way to, to visualize and help you work with lights and their helpers, their light helpers. And so there's different helpers based on the type of light that you have and there is a point light helper. So what we'll do is I create that real quickly. So let's go ahead and put that right here. So const point light helper equals new three point light helper. And we're going to pass in our point light two. And we're also going to specify one here. I forget what that second parameter is for. Oh, I believe it's for the size of the point light. We'll, we'll experiment with that. Um, and then all we have to do is scene add our point light helper. So we save it, we're going to be able to see where that thing is. So let's refresh. So right here, it's like kind of out there far, kind of close to us, because on the Z, Z axis, it's on one. If we push it back down there, now we can kind of see, now we have like a reference point. So let's adjust this to like uh, 0.3 for instance and see what happens. I believe it does just change the scale. Hmm, where are you dude? Let's try two. This would be one of those good, yeah, it does adjust, it, it basically has to do with the scale. So let's just leave it at one. And now we could start moving this thing around and figuring out kind of like where we like like it the most intensity there's not a huge difference on intensity but kind of increase it further yeah let's just go all the way to 10 and now you can just kind of position it where you kind of like it 
Maybe I'm gonna leave it right there. So all these values now we can plug in. So I, uh, when we're setting the position of point light two up here, this is the X, Y, and Z. Make sure you put, you know, not Y, then X. So it's negative 1.86 on the first. On the second, it is, on the Y, it's one. And then on Z, it's negative 1.65. Now when we save this, oh, and the intensity we, we agreed is just gonna be 10. So when we save this, now it's there by default. Awesome, so this looks really cool. It's already starting to come to life already. Now it would be cool for an interesting contrast to have another light down here that's perhaps like blue or something. So let's do that. Well, at this point, we already have a lot of our code written um, for the, the lighting, and then the point light helper, let's get rid of this. So what we can do is just copy from here all the way down. We can just do like uh, light one, or light two rather. This will be light three. All right, so now we have a bunch of things to change. Point light three. And for this one, we're going to uh, and we're not gonna change the color. I'm gonna, we're gonna use dat.gui to experiment with the color, which is really awesome as well. Um, so for a point light two, let's just leave it here, or point light three rather. Let's change all these where we need to change them. Oops, right there. Make sure you update everything that's necessary. And now we have a kind of like a problem. Look at all these, these are all like, they're like grouped together in a weird sort of way uh, that makes it difficult to understand. We have folders that we can use uh, with dat.gui. So let's make use of that um, because that makes a lot more sense. So for the folder, what we'll do is, let me find my point in my reference code here. We create, I a folder called const, actually let's do it right above, right here. Const, um, we'll say light one equals gui.add folder, and we'll call this light one. All right, so now instead of referencing gui, we reference light one right here. Now that first light is gonna be in its own little folder group that we can now extend. Now let's do the same thing real quick over here. This is gonna be light two. Oops, there we go. So now we have both of our lights here that we can control. Let's also give ourselves the ability to change the color. So for our color, we're going to Real quickly, it's a little bit more setup work in order to control colors, but we'll get there. Uh, fairly simple to understand. So we have to first create a, um, a property that we can access the color property inside, or an object rather. We create an object so that we can access the property, the color property inside of it. Light to um, color, we'll say, and equals object with a property of color, and then we'll just put zero x, FF1234, that's red. Then we say light2.add color. This time it's not add, it's gonna be add color. And we're going to pass in, it works the same way. So we pass in the object, light2 color, and the property name color. Then we have to add on change, we specify point light three, because this is uh, what we're in reference to. Oh wait, light two, light one. Okay, I was confused myself because I said light uh, two. Point light three is what we're changing right here, is the color. Point light three dot color dot set, it's gonna be light two color dot color. All right, so basically this means um, in the in the, the dat.gui, when we change it, 
with the little color palette, it's going to notify 3JS to change this color. So that's how you change colors with the debug option for uh, that .gui. So now, uh-oh, we've got a problem. Light to color is not defined. All right, so where, which line was that? Right there. I didn't uh, have the correct uh, camel case or whatever. So let's go ahead and first move this over. We're gonna try to get over here. So Y will come down, X will push it over, and then the color, let's just go to blue. Look at that. How freaking awesome that it is. I love it. Maybe something like that. Look how cool that looks. The intensity. I really like that. All right. So that's how you can uh, use the, the debugger to really help set up everything. Um, not just lights, of course, but all the various properties that you have access to. So this looks really cool. I like it. Um, Let's go ahead now and kind of switch things up. We don't need our helpers anymore, so what we can do is we can take this and comment those out. Save it, they should go away. All right, you could even hide this if you wanted to. And you can also have this collapse by default um, if you wanted to as well. Uh-oh, what happened? We lost something. I think I, I commented um, something out that I shouldn't have. Let me go back. Yeah, because I, I, I commented. What did I uncomment or comment? This is point light helper two. Oh, I know why. I never saved those. Uh, Adjustments. Okay, so <laughs> I was right in, in commenting those out. Let me do this. Um, I'm going to, on my other screen, I have uh, the values I already wanted to use. So I'm just going to specify those right here. So position.set for my light three. Let's see if that works. Ooh, yeah, we have to also, I also didn't change the color. There we go. It's kind of over here a little bit too much. I kind of wanted to push it over, so if I just take my X, there we go. So 2.13 on the X axis is going to give me, let's see here, 2.13, there we go. All right, that's looking pretty cool in my opinion at this point. So now we can add some interactivity, right? So this is kind of cool with how it looks and stuff, but what if you know we wanted to make it move a little bit based on mouse position? So you can do all that. Um, so what we'll do is we're gonna come down and specify, just right around here under the animate section what we'll do first is we're gonna add an event listener and we're gonna uh, make it list make it notify a function so we're gonna say document .add event listener on mouse move we're going to say on uh, document mouse move so that's gonna be a function that we have to create so for that function, first, before we create that, we have to create a few variables. So we're gonna do let mouse x equals zero, let mouse y equals zero as well. And let's do this a couple more times. Target x is gonna be zero and target y will be zero as well. And then also we're gonna create a constant of window half x equals window dot inner width and divide that by two. And then do the same thing on the y axis. So inner height. So we'll take on document mouse move, pass in an event, 
Come on, stop hitting the wrong key. What are you doing? All right, and so inside of here, we're gonna reference our mouse x variable that we defined above. Mouse x equals event dot client x, and that's in relation to the position of the point, the mouse pointer or the cursor when you're moving it around on the x axis. All right, is gonna be y, my, my y minus window half x. All right, and we're gonna do, do the same thing on the y axis. All right, so if you, if you think about it, what's happening here is we're getting the window, the inner width of the actual window, the viewport, um, and we're dividing it by two, all right? So if it's 800, it's gonna be 400. So based on the client X position of the mouse when you're moving it, it's going to subtract that amount from there. And the reason you're doing is just to, to make it a more interesting, um, smoother scroll in terms of how it's going to affect the uh, sphere that we, we move around. All right, so, and we're going to listen for mouse move. So we're gonna document add event listener, mouse move, and we're going to call a function that we're going to create called on document mouse most mouse move. All right. So we have to create a few uh, variables first. So we're going to let mouse x Jesus, what am I doing? <laughs> equals zero. Same thing with y. All right, because we need the x and y position of the mouse movement when you're moving it over. Um, let target x equals zero, and let target y equals zero as well. And then we're gonna create a const um, called window x equals window dot inner width, which is gonna get the width of you know the viewport window. Um, and we're gonna divide that by two. And we're gonna do the same thing with the the y as well, inner height. All right. Now we can create our function on document mouse move and we pass in an event here. And so we say mouse X, which we is currently set as zero above equals event.client X. And if we console log that, we start moving our mouse around, you'll start seeing a bunch of numbers go up and down uh, on the Y or the, the horizontal axis at least. Um, and then we're gonna subtract that from window ha or window X rather. All right, do the same thing on Y. All right, just like that. So replace those three X's with three Y's. So what this is doing is I, uh, you know, we, if the, the width of the window is 1600 pixels, it's gonna be 800 for window X and then we take the position of the mouse on the X and Y axis and we subtract that. Uh, we subtract window X and window Y respectively. Now, why are we having this? Uh, it just affects um, how much, or it's gonna affect the movement um, of the, the object, the sphere that we're going to use uh, these values for, if that makes any sense. Probably doesn't at this point, but that's okay. And all we're gonna do is now that we have our uh, mouse X, we say our target X, which is currently set at zero up top and target Y as well, equals mouse X times and then point zero zero one. We'll do the same thing on Y. And guess what? Let's see here, make sure this actually works. Oh, it's not gonna work yet. Not gonna work just yet. We're gonna come down here. Now we have sphere rotation Y, which is why it's currently spinning. We're gonna leave that there because if that somebody's, I want movement all the time. So if the, the mouse isn't over it or whatever, or their, your finger or whatever, uh, I still want movement. So we're gonna say sphere dot rotation dot X, or we'll start with Y again, plus equals, this time it's gonna to add to itself, 0.5 times target X, minus sphere.rotation.y. 
Let's save it and it should work in relation to our mouse. There it goes. Look at that. So it's off the screen, it keeps on going, but then we interrupt it. Now let's add that for the other two axes. X, this is gonna be Y, and this is gonna be X. So let's save, well let's not do that, let's just do this one real quick. Z, it's gonna be Y here and X here. Um, we're gonna play around with these values though. So now you can see it's really adjusting things quite a bit. Um, let's change this to 0 0.05 and 0 0.05 here and we'll also flip this on the negative. So now it's kind of really adjusting things differently. All right, cool. Now, what else can we do? All right, so we can also make this uh, respond to the scroll position. And in order to do that, we're first gonna get back into our index.html and we're gonna add a little bit of markup here. So we're gonna have a container class and it's gonna be h1 feel, fell, feel the sphere. After it, we're gonna have an empty section so that we can create some scroll. So in our style.css, we're just gonna create a few rule sets. So for our WebGL, instead of position fixed, because we want it to go out of view, we're gonna say position absolute. All right, and then we're going to come down here and we're gonna say H, uh, no, our container. And we're gonna say height, 100 viewport height, display grid, and place items center. That's gonna center the text vertically and horizontally. Can't see it because it's black and in the back and not very big. So let's take our H1. We're gonna say font size, eight rem units. Text transform is gonna be uppercase. Color's gonna be white. Let's save it. Ooh, that's big. The reason that's big is because I'm at 150% zoom. There we go. All right, that's really cool. Um, let's take our section as well and give it a height of 100 viewport height. Now we can scroll down. By the way, let's get rid of these controls real quick. So we can just go back to script. They're kind of annoying me. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so if I take all this right here, comment that out, all this, comment that out. We should be good to go. And of course we're not, I broke something. Light two is not defined. Um, let's see here, up oh, right here. Comment, on, that's, that was just for the lighting portion or the coloring rather. Refresh, all right, there we go. Now wouldn't it be cool if we could, um, um, let's see here, if we can make it so that this is sort of transparent in some way. What we can actually do is on the WebGL class, on the canvas element, we can place a mixed blend mode. We'll say exclusion. Look at that, isn't that cool? I thought it was interesting. All right, so now we have this ability to kind of scroll down. Oh, let's also get rid of this horizontal scroll bar and we can do that with, if I can find it. Um, so in order for this to work, we can't just play it on, place it on the HTML and the body. We have to do body alone, overflow X hidden. If we did it on both the HTML and body, then you can't scroll down anymore. It kind of disables it for some reason. So now, here we go. We don't have that anymore. All right. So how about like if we scroll this down, maybe something happens to the size of the sphere or something like that. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll go back to our script.js. All right, basically right in our animate section. And we want uh, to call 
another element. Let's come right down here. So we're going to say window dot add event listener, just like we did before. And this time, not mouse move, but it's going to be on scroll. And we're going to call update sphere. All right. So we're going to say const update sphere equals event. And inside of here, we'll just say sphere.position.y. So I guess we'll just move it up. Instead of scaling, you could scale as well if you wanted. Window.scrolly times something really small. Because if you leave it by default with just scroll y without multiplying it by a smaller uh, number, it'll, it'll just shoot out really fast, like instantly. So let's save that. Now we kind of have a little bit of a parallax effect occurring here. Let's also uh, update the position. Um, in fact, that's what I meant to do down here. It was not supposed to be position. It's supposed to be rotation. It was supposed to be position. There we go. So now we're ad adjusting it. We're making it look like it's growing, but that's only because we have a, a position on the Z axis. And look at that. Look how cool that is. Awesome, awesome stuff. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. I, I know it's a, it's a lot, it's a big crash course essentially, um, but definitely consider taking Bruno's course um, at 3JS Journey. Um, and it, it is elaborate. I'm not even done with it myself. I'm only halfway through. Um, so yeah. Anyhow, keep an eye out for a lot more 3JS content. Make sure to subscribe, give me a comment, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.